come to lecture 21 of Fox, we're going to be talking about deviations from the mean. Or how good is the mean at summarizing the outcome of an experiment with respect to the quantity, the measurement that we are interested in, okay, which we call the random variable. Now, last time we talked about computing expected values, specifically the expected value of a sum. Okay, the expected value of a sum is the sum of expected values. And we applied this to the sum of dice, the binomial, which we represent as a sum of binary or Bernoulli random variables, the waiting time, which we had to sort of creatively represent as a sum of waiting times to uh, each success, and we applied that to coupon collecting. Then we talked about the law of total expectation and how that can be used to, to, to compute expectations in a build-up fashion. And, you know, finally, we, you know, discussed, the, you know, the, this novel concept of, you know, indicator random variables, which are Bernoulli random variables that become very useful if you can represent your random variable as a sum of indicators. Then, you know, the expected value is the sum of the expected values of the indicators, and the, and the expected value of an indicator is very easy to compute. It's just the probability of success for that indicator, okay? So be on the lookout for sums of indicator random variables. Now, what are we going to talk about today? The main goal is to discuss the quality of the expected value. And we're going to call sometimes the expected value the mean. So how well does the mean summarize the experiment, summarize the random variable? And we're, so we're going to introduce the variance, okay? And then we're going to use this variance to, to develop what's called the three sigma rule. So basically, the variance is, the, is sigma squared. And basically, we're going to show that, you know, whenever you run the experiment, what you observe, the outcome, the random variable will be, roughly speaking, 90% of the time within three sigma of the expected value, within three sigma of the mean. And we call this the three sigma rule. Okay. So you know, let's, uh, let's begin. And you know, let's start from the very beginning. So we start with an experiment. It's a random experiment. Okay? So that means that the outcome is uncertain. And it's a complex experiment. So the outcomes are complex. Okay? So we're not so interested in the complex outcomes. So we summarize, we sort of simplify the outcomes with respect to this, this thing that we are interested in measuring, this quantity that you know, we represent by a random variable. Okay. So a random variable represents, simplifies the outcome to the quantity of interest, like the number of heads in, in 100 coin tosses. We're not really interested in each individual head. We are interested in um, you know, the number of heads. Or if, you, if, if 100 kids throw their hats in the, in the air and the hats ran, ha, land randomly on their heads, we're not interested in specifically who got what hat. We might be only interested in how many kids got the correct hat. Okay. So this measurement we call a random variable. It summarizes the outcome. Okay. And associated with, the me with this measurement, with this random variable, are possible values and probabilities for those values. And that becomes our new sort of sample space and probability distribution function. And we can now more or less ignore the complex experimental outcomes okay. and focus on the random variable. And then we summarized even more. We said, wow. The random variable has all these possible outcomes and all these probabilities associated with each possible measured value. Okay, can we summarize that? We summarize that in the expected value. So what's going to happen if you run the experiment many times, take the measurement many times, and then average those? Okay, in some sense, you know, what do you expect to happen in the experiment when you run it and measure the quantity of interest? And that's the expected value. And how good is that? How good is that at summarizing the outcome of the experiment? That's what we're going to study today. How good is the expected value or mean at summarizing the outcome of the experiment? Here's an experiment that you, know, you can do. So roll n dice. Okay, so you roll n dice. And now the measurement we're going to make is the average of the roll. So take the sum and divide by n. That's going to be our random variable of interest. Okay? The measurement, the quantity that we are interested in. Okay, now let's compute the expected value of this random variable. What is this random variable? It's the average of the n rolls. Okay? So we want the expected value of the average. Okay, so that's, that's important to make, to make sure that you realize we're computing the expected value of the average. And what is the average? The average is the sum divided by n. Okay, so we're computing the expected value of the sum divided by n. Okay, and this 1 over n is crucial here. Okay, because, you know, we have the linearity of expected value, which says that we can take this constant 1 over n outside the expectation. Okay, so we get 1 over n times the expected value of a sum. But now we know that the expected value of a sum is the sum of the expected values. Okay, and so we get the sum of the expected values of n dice rolls. Okay, and each dice roll is, you know, basically the same. They're independent, identical dice rolls. So each of them has the expected value 3.5 from, you know, last lecture. And so the sum 
will have an expected value that is n times that because we take the sum of the individual n expected values. So the, the, so the expected value of the sum is n times three and a half. We multiply by the one over n, the n's cancel, and we get three and a half. Now that's interesting. Okay. So when we roll n dice and take the average of the rolls, the expected value of that average is three, or three and a half, and it is independent of the number of dice we roll. Now that's a bit surprising, right? The expected value of the average is independent of the number of dice we roll. And that's precisely because we're computing the average. Okay? On the other hand, if you think about it, you know, if we roll one dice, okay, the average is just the value roll, and that's wildly fluctuating between one and six. Okay? On average, in expected value, if we, did, if we repeated that experiment of rolling one dice and taking the average many, many times, we'll get three and a half. But any specific roll could be anywhere from one to six. Okay? So it varies wildly in comparison to the expected value. On the other hand, what happens if we roll 100 dice and take the average? So I did this experiment. Okay. So I, you know, I rolled one dice, took the average. Roll two, three, four, and so on, up to 10,000, up to 100,000, and took the average. And what, what do we observe? Okay. What we observe is that when I roll a small number of dice, you see how the outcome, the actual outcome, this is, so I roll the dice, take the average. So for example, I roll 10 dice, take the average, and this is the actual outcome. And it's fluctuating around the expected value of 3.5, and the fluctuations are quite large. Okay. But as I take the average of more and more dice, so when my experiment involves 10,000 dice or 100,000 dice, okay, I roll, I take the average, and look, it's, the actual outcome doesn't fluctuate much around 3.5. So, to understand what's going on here, let's compare two cases, rolling four dice versus rolling a hundred dice. Okay. And, you know, so, uh, on the left, I'm showing the, 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 the random variable which corresponds to the average of four dice. So, what, what, what are we seeing on the x-axis here? On the x-axis are the possible values, so one up to, up to six in intervals of one-fourth. Okay. And, you know, what we're showing here is the probability distribution function for the average of four dice. Okay, so each possible outcome, and then how likely is that outcome? And we see that you know the outcomes around 3.5, which is the expected value, are by far the most likely outcomes. Okay, but it's still quite reasonably likely to get a five, or even a six, or two, or a one. Okay, so there's some range which includes the likely values, and then outside this range is unlikely to occur. And so we've you know we've quantified this range by you know a width of this PDF, which we have labeled sigma. Now we have a specific idea what sigma should be, but for the moment intuitively think of this as the range within which the likely outcomes of this experiment will occur, the average of four dice. Okay? And roughly speaking, the range is let's say two to five. Okay, so sigma is approximately 1.5, let us say. Okay? Now what about you know, the average of 100 dice, totally different picture. You see, even though one is possible, you could get all 100 ones and the average is one, but it hardly ever happens. In fact, in my experiment, it never happened. Okay, and the, the outcomes for, for the average of 100 dice are pretty much, you know, in the range three to four. Okay, and so the width of this uh, PDF, you know, the, the likely range for the random variable is much smaller. Okay, so what do we observe? When you roll a small, uh, a, a small number of dice, the actual outcome, the actual average, oscillates reasonably wildly around the actual uh, expected value. So the, the variations are large. Okay? There's a lot of variability. But when you, roll, when you roll a larger number of dice, the variability is small. And that's what we're going to quantify today. And we're going to start by defining the variance and then use the variance to show that you know, we can get a very convenient range for a random variable which, you know, which, which says that your random variable will be within this range with, you know, high probability, with let's say 90% chances approximately.